Coming up on Market to Market, the clock is ticking as another trade war looms. Planters roll as waters rise across the country. Cyclists seek common ground with cattle ranchers on public land. And market analysis with Elaine Cub next. These markets will move together. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com. This is the Friday, June 7 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Delaney Howell. Fighting a trade war on multiple fronts has started to weigh on the overall economy. Only 75,000 jobs were created in May, and the Labor Department has cut numbers previously reported for March and April. Despite seesawing job numbers, the unemployment rate has held steady at 3.6%. The Fed says the economy is getting soft and is considering an interest rate cut to prevent the nation's economic engine from stalling. One-fourth of North American car production takes place in Mexico. This includes several versions of pickup trucks that eventually travel the gravel roads of rural America. The looming trade war has more than just automakers wondering what the price of goods will be in the near future. Peter Tubbs has more. A week of negotiations between Mexico and the United States have so far failed to avoid looming tariffs. A tariff of 5% on all imported goods from the nation's second largest trading partner are scheduled to take effect on Monday. Mexico exports $418 billion worth of goods annually, and the U.S. imports 80% of the total. Unlike the current trade dispute with China, the proposed tariffs are in response to a political rather than economic issue. An increase in illegal immigration from Central America, with Mexico acting as a conduit, has sparked a battle between the White House and new Mexican President Andres Manuel Obrador. The administration is asking the Mexican government to slow the flow of immigrants across the shared border, or tariffs on all Mexican imports will be imposed. The Mexican government has taken a conciliatory tone in its public statements. We are optimistic because we have a, a good meeting with respectable respectful position from both parts. Automobiles, trucks, and their respective parts are the lion's share of Mexico's export volume to the United States. Supply chains have grown more complex since the signing of NAFTA in 1994, and vehicle components cross the border up to eight times before final assembly. Multiple tariffs charged on multiple crossings would inflate the cost of autos paid by the American consumer. The prospect of a spiraling tariff war with the nation's largest trading partner spooked markets and drew a cool reception from Republicans in Washington. We're not fans of tariffs. We're still hoping that this can be avoided. At the same time, it's way past time the president's request for assistance from our government be met. Now, I have said that I didn't agree with the president on these tariffs. I'm not backing off of that. I don't think it's the right thing to do. A 5% tariff takes effect on Monday, June 10th, and will increase by 5% each month until the tariff reaches 25%. The additional duties will end when illegal crossings at the border drop. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. The president signed the Disaster Tax Relief Act of 2019 on Thursday. The $19 billion package will help deal with many of the recent weather disasters. More severe weather broke out in Oklahoma late this week, continuing a spring trend, as Paul Yeager reports. 
May was the second wettest month on record in several states. The trend has begun spreading across multiple time zones. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration reports the U.S. just finished the wettest 12-month period on record. 18 states set marks for the most rain and snow. Record high water has yet to recede across Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri. And much of those same areas had rainfall again this week, as revealed in the weekly precipitation accumulation map. High water is still making it through America's waterways. Currently, 58 gauges reveal major flooding with much of it along the Mississippi, Missouri, and Arkansas rivers. The U.S. Coast Guard says 700 miles of the Mississippi, Illinois, and Missouri rivers are closed to navigation, cutting off barge traffic. High water remains a major problem in Arkansas. Homes are protected by makeshift levees, and the fight to keep property dry is a never-ending battle. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers says more than 40 levees have been overtopped in Missouri in just the last two weeks. The pattern limited spring field work opportunities, as both corn and soybeans remain behind the five-year planting pace. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. It's a reoccurring conflict in the West where relaxing in the great outdoors comes up against those who use the land as part of their livelihood. Our Josh Bittner discovered a place where conflict has been overpowered by coexistence and has more in our cover story. Since its birth in the Old West era, farming and ranching have been tied to Grand Junction's economy. Now the largest metro area on Colorado's western slope, recent decades have seen the region's picturesque landscapes attract a new wave of stakeholders. One of the challenges in the West right now is finding common ground between livestock producers and agriculturalists and outdoor recreation people. Typically running over 500 head of cattle on 12,000 acres of city-owned land, Janie Van Winkle and her husband Howard are accustomed to sharing resources and dealing with adversity. Drought last year forced them to sell off around 20% of their herd. While they rebuild, a downhill bike trail is looking to break ground and eventually cut through their ranch. This particular part of Colorado has been a pretty underappreciated part of the state for a long time. George Gotchis is general manager of Over the Edge Sports in nearby Fruta, which has become a mountain biking mecca. The area boasts hundreds of miles of single track trails, initially constructed on public land by volunteers, led by the Colorado Plateau Mountain Bike Trail Association, or COP MOBA. The 30-year-old nonprofit has five chapters and roughly 500 members. In 2016, the group's $1.6 million Palisade Plunge Trail proposal was given the go-ahead by state government, though no funds were allocated. COP MOBA president Scott Winan says it's not uncommon for a new trail to take a decade from concept to completion, and cites responsible partnerships with federal, county, city, and other community partners. To build a mountain bike trail, we have to do a bunch of environmental studies, archaeological studies. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Initial trail plans would have sliced through the heart of the Van Winkles lease with the city of Grand Junction. The ranchers were concerned that excess trash, trespassing, and habitat disruption would be a problem. Despite some missed opportunities early on, all sides were eventually able to come to the table, mend fences, and reach a consensus. They're going to cut across two corners of that property, and that'll work for us, and, and they're, they're comfortable with it too. The trailhead will drop in atop scenic Grand Mesa, considered the largest flat top mountain in the world at over 11,000 feet, and end 32 miles below in the town of Palisade. And then down on the other side of that ridge and drop. Some local business owners estimate trail users will generate a $2.5 million annual windfall for the region's economy. It's an epic ride, once in a lifetime opportunity is what I'm told. I'm not a bicyclist. COP MOBA and others stress their eye-opening multi-year discourse has helped community building between ranchers and cyclists. We both love the land. Um, we use it slightly differently. Um, so that's probably bound to bring some differences of opinion too. So. 
And the Van Winkles agree, even if sometimes it might be a tough pill for them to swallow. In my opinion, it's the mountain that loses. All of us who live in the Grand Junction in the valley, this is a place you can look up to and know that it's pristine and it's, it's special. And, and I think it changes the flavor. All manner of activity on western public lands, whether biking, grazing, hunting, or mining, to name a few, fall under the purview of the U.S. Bureau of Land Management. Of the more than 245 million acres overseen by the federal agency, about 13 percent of the nation's land, over 8 million of those acres are in Colorado. Grazing permits on public land are administered by the BLM and the U.S. Forest Service. And federal numbers reveal livestock foraging activities generate almost $150 million annually in Colorado. You expect that you're going to see livestock grazing in those same areas. And so I think a lot of the bicyclists realize that a lot of their trails actually came from cattle walking through this area. And somebody decided to ride a bike on it. And, you know, eventually it became a big sport and the BLM adopted those trails. Colin Ewing is the National Conservation Area Manager for nearby McInnes Canyons. Some of these lands are just too dry or too rugged to make it make sense for farming, so they were never homesteaded, and uh, they ended up being managed by the Bureau of Land Management for multiple uses. 21 grazing allotments sit among the nearly 300 miles of trail and river access that bring 250,000 visitors per year to McInnes Canyons. You're seeing that a lot in the West now, ranching and mining towns that are still ranching and mining towns, but also are inviting tourism into their economy. One of the BLM's biggest challenges is accommodating multiple uses of terrain owned by all Americans. In some cases, that necessity has become the mother of invention. So this is a bicycle cattle guard, so that the bicyclists don't have to get off their bike to open the gate, and so the gates don't get left open, so the cow stays in the pasture and everybody has a good time. Many ranchers employ rotational grazing practices to regenerate pasture, but the Van Winkles say high visitor turnover can quickly degrade shared ground and leave regulars to blame. We're an easy target. But in reality, it's all of the uses, and we have to figure out how we're going to make that all work together. And toward that end, beginning next year, Van Winkle will serve as president of the Colorado Cattlemen's Association and likely be asked to weigh in on similar issues across the state. And if fundraising goals are met by the end of July, Cop Mobile will begin phase one of the Palisade Plunge. We were able to come up with a compromise, and I think that's really important no matter what we're talking about. Just understanding each other, that's a really important piece. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Trade talks, planting progress, and private acreage estimates pushed the markets lower. For the week, July wheat slipped two cents, while the nearby corn contract declined 11 cents. Improving weather conditions for planting pressured the soy complex. The July soybean contract dropped 22 cents. July meal dropped $9 per ton. July cotton shrank 249 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, July class three milk futures fell a penny. Another mixed week in the livestock markets. August cattle gained 22 cents. August feeders improved 412. And the July lean hog contract cut 258. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index plummeted 118 ticks. July crude oil strengthened by 45 cents per barrel. Comex gold bumped up 34.10 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index was even to finish at 406.35. Joining us now to offer insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Elaine Cub. Elaine, welcome back. Well, I'm happy to be here at this interesting time for the grain markets. It is an interesting time, Elaine. Let's talk about that. Starting off here with what happened in the wheat markets this week, they really felt like they were kind of pushing everything else forward and then maybe help 
had pulled back there because of corn and soybeans this week. You're right. There was a day, I think it was Thursday, when wheat was in the lead. And I think if wheat was trading on its own, it would have a bullish story to trade uh, with dryness in Russia. There was some dryness in parts of Europe that were re relieved, actually, by some rain this week. Uh, dryness in Australia, which kind of doesn't matter, but they're planting in the dust, which you know, some, some U.S. farmers would have liked to have done. So there is enough of a bullish story for wheat for to take the lead on certain days. But you're right, how much of the, the movement over the past two or three weeks, the upward movement in wheat, how much of that is due to its own story versus how much of it is following along with the U.S. row crops, it's really hard to judge at this point. So, Elaine, we uh, hit the $5 mark. We're hovering right in there. How much higher do you think we can chug along here over the next couple of weeks, especially if we continue to see maybe unfavorable weather? Yeah. In the U.S. wheat market, I, I don't believe that it would be justified to go much above that $5 okay. level because look at the condition ratings. They're actually really beautiful everywhere except Ohio, where those, that, that soft red winter wheat has experienced some of the same flooding and, and wet problems that the row crops have. So that's why we see this interesting price differential between the hard red winter wheat and the soft red winter wheat. That's not completely unusual over the past five years. but. The, generally speaking, especially for the hard red winter wheat, the condition ratings are beautiful. This rain, rain makes grain sort of thing that I hate to say, but it, it does work for the winter wheat this year. Okay, it does work for the winter wheat. Uh, not so much when we talk about the corn and soybean markets. Let's talk corn first here, Elaine. They pulled back very drastically this week. We still didn't have extremely favorable planting progress report on Monday. Why no. did we have this <laughs> this spark down in, in the corn market? Yeah, that's a very important question. Uh, rain makes grain, but only if you can get it planted, if the rain doesn't stop the grain from getting planted. And that has been what's happened in corn. Why we don't have continued bullishness through this week, I think, is perhaps related to the fact that there's a WASDE report coming up next week, and that shouldn't matter because those numbers, there's no way the USDA will be able to fully incorporate any sort of acreage projection or reality because nobody knows what the reality is or will be until we get another week or so of weather forecasts. We just don't know. But it may be the timing of that report is such that if anybody, any speculators or funds would otherwise be willing to start making bullish bets, they've, they've pulled back all of their bearish short bets, but we haven't seen that we know of yet any big build of bullish bets. They may be waiting for that report to get out of the way, and then the timing of it would allow that to move forward again next week. So we've got the WASDE report coming out. As you mentioned, they're probably not going to touch acreage at this point, but do you think they will adjust yields? They would have a justification to adjust either one of them, and they, they do take, into, take weather into account as they make these numbers. I'm just saying that there is no real number yet. Even individual farmers couldn't give you an exact number of acres of corn or soybeans that they will have planted at the end of this planting season, because the end of this planting season is July. I mean, you know, this goes on and on until until people get too scared about fall weather or about hot weather in the summer. This late planting makes it impossible for us to know any acreage number right now, uh, even if you wanted to put it on a supply and demand table. Okay, it makes it impossible to know it, but I'm going to ask you an acreage question because we've been asking every analyst kind of as they've been coming back to the show. We've got another planting progress report on Monday. We've had a pretty good week in most of the Corn Belt this past week. So coming Monday, what do you think we're going to see for the planting progress report? And what do you think we're going to see as your final estimates here for corn and soybean acres? Okay. So over the past seven days, there have been some pockets of the Corn Belt that weren't completely flooded with new precipitation. There is more precipitation in the forecast for this weekend for Illinois and Indiana, which are very wet. Um, and just I've taken a pretty extensive road trip through the Western Corn Belt myself and where, the, where it is dry, everybody is going like crazy, spraying and doing everything else. So in those pockets, there will be, I think, some progress to take us above that 45% number or 67% number, take us up to, you know, maybe towards 80. Um, I, I'm not real confident about that. And I'm not, of course, real confident about an acreage number either. But we knew even at the end of May that 33% of the corn acres were still unplanted effectively. Uh, not all of those have come in there. So my number has always been somewhere between three and 33 million acres left unplanted to corn by the time this is all done. But that's, that's, <laughs> that's, a, a, pretty, <laughs> that's a pretty big range. But the point is that it's going to be much bigger than anything we've ever seen before in the history of the U.S. growing corn. It's not going to be a normal three million acres 
just from a slightly wet year with some flooding and some river bottom ground. This is widespread problems and big swaths of the Corn Belt just from not being able to get into the fields. So you're looking at something more like the six to 10 million acres lost. And is corn. that a conservative, conservative estimate? I don't think that's conservative. I think okay. that's, that's sort of the conventional wisdom at the moment and okay. I, I, don't, I don't take any quibble with that. Okay. Let's talk about the soybean markets. They also pulled back this week. I believe they still have two gaps left to fill. Will they fill those two? You know, that's that is something that these markets like to do. But if you get start, if you start to get really bullish about corn prices because of lost planting, then you look at the forecast and this upcoming prevented planting date for soybeans is now coming up. Now the same story that we've been saying about corn hasn't suddenly been solved by really good dry sunny weather everywhere. So Illinois, for instance, only had 21% of their soybeans planted last Sunday. Like I mentioned, they've got more rain in the forecast this weekend. So, you know, if you lose 80% of Illinois soybean acres, now you start to get just as bullish about soybeans as you were about corn. And the market hasn't yet. I, I mean, obviously the market has not, but I think fundamentally that argument could be made. Do you still make that argument even with, I know it's it's kind of like a broken record here, but the, the huge carryout that we have and the production that's going on in Argentina and Brazil, does it still create a, a bullish fundamental? I think more bullish than is currently being reflected. We still see wide carry spreads in the soybean market all the way out to 2020. The, the commercial side of the market still feels very, very comfortable about soybean supplies, which made sense in the world when we had the trade war and we weren't selling very many of them to China, but we're selling some. We do see sales being yes. made to China in the export sales report. So it's not nothing. And we still have a domestic soybean industry, uh, a livestock industry that needs to eat soybean meal. Um, so. I feel, in my opinion, that the market has lots of room to reflect more bullishness than it is reflecting right now. Okay, let's continue this discussion. We'll table it for Market Plus. We've got to talk about the livestock markets, especially I want to start here with feeders. Sometimes they get the short end of the stick. But have August feeders put in a bottom? They might have. Now, when you look at the chart, they could still get drugged down by the, the general bearishness of the livestock sector. But the feeder chart itself does, like you mentioned, they had a little bounce there and, and it looks kind of like a bottom. The other beautiful thing that's working in the favor of the feeder cattle market is all this rain that's not good for planting has been very good for pasture conditions and hay conditions if you're not like so wet you can't get the hay uh, created. Um, so the feeder market, I, I would be a little more neutral to, to favorable that they might have put in a bottom. Okay. If they've put in a bottom, are they going to see some uptrend here or trade in maybe a range bound? It depends on, you know, what is driving what is driving the whole cattle sector downwards. And I don't honestly know if it's an economic thing or if it's a worry about the cost of corn. So if the, if the feed grain prices continue going up, I wouldn't expect to see a bounce in the feeder cattle where you'd see, you know, October much above 140. Okay, what about in the live cattle markets? They're having similar issues, I'd say. Yeah, they have been on a pretty serious downtrend here through the last half of May, uh, down about 15% in the futures. Now, the cash market hasn't fallen as much, but it has also pulled back. And as you look forward to the next couple of weeks or through June and July, I feel the packers are pretty comfortable about the supplies that they know are going to be coming into them. So, you know, that, that pullback that we've had, that 10 to 15% pullback is probably going to main, be maintained for the next six weeks, let's say. Okay, let's talk to round out our discussion about the hog markets. We've seen China come in. They've been making pretty substantial export sales each week now for a couple of weeks, but we've got this looming potential tariff thing happening on Monday with Mexico, who's of course one of our big pork trading partners. What happens when we open on Monday, Elaine? Well, the, the bearishness and the, the gloom in the hog market is, of course, somewhat related to the Mexico problem, but that's just guessing about what sort of retaliatory tariffs they might take on us. You wouldn't even have to have that gloom. You could have gloom in the hog market just from the domestic side alone because the industry tried to get so ramped up on this idea that there would be these huge exports to China this summer, and that hasn't happened yet. And, you know, we talked about this every time I come on here. We think maybe six <laughs> months down the line, six months down the line, it just doesn't happen, and it just doesn't happen. So domestically, you had these very high prices that have depressed the consumer when they go to the grocery store, and you've got lots of supply. High prices and lots of supply is not a winning formula, and so that's, that's why we've seen hogs uh, have such a downtrend. And will we continue with this downtrend? 
it, there may still need to be room for that to come off, especially if the Mexico story becomes worse. Opening up the trade here on Monday, we don't know yet what the retaliation will be, but let's say Mexico next week issues and says pork is going to be part of the retaliation against the U.S., then what is the new scenario for downwards? It continues <laughs> downwards. I mean, I, I, well, I wouldn't have a price target for you, but I will point this out, is that currently the, the front month lean hog contract is still higher than it was when we started this year. So it's not like we're at like some bottom level of support on the chart. There's still okay. lots of room on the chart for it to keep going down. Okay. Elaine Cub, thank you so much. Thanks. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but we will keep this conversation going on Market Plus, where we'll answer more of your questions. You can find it on our website at markettomarket.org. Using Twitter allows you to keep in the loop with just a few characters. We share news, pictures, and behind-the-scenes information on our feed of at Market to Market. Join us again next week when we'll explore how one Midwestern state is trying to help small towns revitalize their local economies. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Delaney Howell. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. Steel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com.